Well, folks, you know you're in for a treat when you hear that tune because it's a time for another week of the Rec Poker Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Jones, 5x5 five five in the home game and 5x5B5 five five, five five on Twitter, filling in for Jim Reed, who's in Vegas right now and having a great time uh, in those parts. Uh, tonight, we're talking poker strategy as part of the forums edition. Um, and as, as always, I have to start by thanking our sponsors, the Running Aces Hotel, Racetrack, and Casino. Most of what we do at Rec Poker is free. We're a largely volunteer-based organization, so we depend on support from our sponsors and also from our premium members. Um, you can take part and become a premium member for just $15 a month, um, and for la- that's less than 50 cents a day. Uh, you can come connect with Zoom to have fun, find encouraging poker players, all trying to get better together. Um, or you can sign up um, right now Um In the month of December, you can sign up during our Naughty and Nice sale. Uh, You can get your first month of Rec Poker for only a dollar. Just enter the code NICE at checkout, um, and you will get that special price. Um, So they, uh, you know, I'm hosting tonight, filling in for Jim, but it always takes multiple people to make the magic happen around here. We call those group of people who make that magic happen the Wrecking Crew. Um, so I am joined here by one of my fellow favorite Wrecking Crew members, uh, Rob. Why don't you introduce yourself? I'm Rob Washam, and I'm Rabman50 just about everywhere you can find me. Awesome. Awesome. And tonight we are talking about a hand that Eric Anderson played in an online tournament. He submitted it on Discord. Uh, we have a hand history section there as well, as well as the forums on our website. So if you're looking for feedback on uh, one of those, uh, on something that you played recently, come join us in the forums and and uh, share your experience. You get lots of great feedback on it, and you might get uh, might get it aired on one of these episodes as well. So in this tournament, Eric is playing 80 big blinds deep, um, and he is on the button, and he has ace of clubs, jack of clubs. Um, And he uncontroversially opens that uh, hand um, before the small blind um, three bets him to 11 big blinds. Um, I think he pretty uncontroversially elects to call. We're deep enough. We're suited. We've got an ace blocker. Um, I think this is a, a fairly standard hand that we might call with against certain players. Maybe we find a fold or maybe we get a little bit frisky with some kind of a, uh, a four bet, but I think this is a pretty standard call in position C three and kind of move on. Um, Rob, anything to add before we get into the more of the meat of this hand? Um, No, I think if I had ace Jack offsuit, I prop, I could very definitely fold to a three bet. Yep. Yep. Agreed. The thing is, Keep in mind that we're talking the small blind and not the big blind. It has to be a little bit tighter than the big blind because the small blind still has the big blind to deal with. So basically, if the small blind is raising, they're going to be raising with a much tighter range than the big blind might be raising. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Um, And so... I think we just kind of get to this. I think this is this is just pretty standard. Um, and then so the, the hand starts to get really interesting when we hit the flop. So the flop comes ace of diamonds, eight of spades, eight of clubs. So we get a paired board. We hit our ace. We've got backdoor clubs. Um, and the small blind after three betting checks to us. Um, and we elect to check back. Um you know, Rob, what what are you what are you thinking in this spot? What do you think of like when small blind checks to us, and what do you think about our approach in this on this flop? Well, you know, some of the studying we've done lately with uh, considering GTO and things like that, uh, being out of position is a tough spot to be in, and it does call for checking a lot of times with some very strong hands. Yep. Um, basically, GTO says we're protecting our checking range or something like that, right? So 
just because he checks doesn't mean he's not strong in this spot. Yeah. As a matter of fact, um, if he bets, if he bets small in this spot, which is what he probably should do with portions of his range, I would think he would be weaker than checking in the spot. So, yeah. you know, something like pocket Kings or pocket Queens or, you know, ace or maybe King Queen, King Jack, King 10, those types of hands um, would be more than likely to bet here um, than they would with the stronger parts of their range. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's kind of, kind of counterintuitive, but I think it's a GTO um, strategy. Yeah, and I think it's it, the, you're exactly right. I think some of the some of our ace X here, um, as the small blind can can check here fairly reasonably, um, and um, I, I actually don't mind. I think we are probably sort of kind of going either way. I think it's pretty fifty fifty whether we bet or whether we check here, but we are. Um, this is not. As, although we have the ace, it's not the strongest hand in the world. Um, and we're still on the lookout for things that might be able to beat us here. So I I, I kind of like this check back. Let's shorten the hand. We still have position. Let's see how they, the, the small blind reacts to that. Um, and our hand can really uh, gain some value as we kind of progress in this hand too, uh, which it actually does. We check back and the turn is the six of clubs. So now the board... It is ace of diamonds, eight of clubs, eight of spades, six of clubs. So now we've, uh, in addition to our our paired ace, we have the nut flush draw, uh, even on this paired board. And then, um, so there's about 24 big blinds in the pot, and the small blind bets half pot. They bet 12 big blinds into us after seeing this six of clubs. Um, and... What do, what do you think? I mean, now now our hand's gotten more equity, but we still have some of those hands that were not, you know, that are still possible in, in villain's range, such as ace-king and ace-queen that, that feel very real, uh, and aces even. Um, you know, what what do you think in here? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, we, we've gained equity. Um, it's very, it's kind of unusual to... Um, raise as a bluff in on the turn, especially when you have top air. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's it's tough to to find yourself in a bluffing position, but you could, I think, raise here on the virtue of the fact that you do have the flush draw. Mm -hmm. And doing this with, you know, like we talked about earlier, a hand like King Queen. Pocket nines, pocket tens. It could be anything that we're actually ahead of right now. We don't really have a a good. Um, it's, his range is still very wide open because of the check check. So his range could be very wide open. We could be ahead right now. We mm -hmm. could be getting some value from uh, you know maybe some of those pocket pairs, or maybe a king queen of clubs, for instance. Uh, we, we could get some. You know, we could get some. Um, value from so it it is a spot where you can take occasionally take this spot and and raise yeah i mean it's interesting um when you think about who's more likely to have an eight here um it feels like we are it feels pretty equal i think that depending how how ambitious a three better the small blind is they might be able to have hands like ace eight suited, nine eight suited, um, seven eight suited, you know, a few others. Obviously, we both can have pocket eights, I think. Um, there's only one combo of that. But, but beyond that, you know, we are, their range is, is, would not love to see a raise. And the eight, the portion of it that has an eight in it is so small compared to the rest of what uh, the villain is doing this with that. It, it isn't a terrible idea to consider the uh, a raise here. Um, we, we could be exactly, I mean, the question is, can we get better to fold? And I, that's, that's 
tricky. It's probably going to be a multi-barrel approach and maybe kind of ill-advised. So I think the standard line would be to call here, but we could get away with like a really small min click uh, raise here and see, see where that gets. Um, but Eric, Eric does just call, which I think is the more standard play. Um, and now the pot is 48 big blinds and we have 57 behind. Um, and the river is the 10 of spades. So the final board is the ace of diamonds, eight of spades, eight of clubs, six of clubs, 10 of spades. And into this action, the small blind bets into a 48 big blind pot. They bet 24 big blinds and it is on us. And this is where I think this hand gets maybe the most interesting, I think fairly standard until this point. Um, you know, maybe there's a few things we could do differently here or there, but I'm going to advocate, and I'm curious what you think, Rob, that on this river with this exact holding that we should find way more folds than calls, um, that it's now really bad that we have these clubs, um, because when we're thinking about what are we what are we hoping that our opponent flips over if we call here i you know i guess it's it's hands it's hands like like king queen of clubs maybe or something like that um but there's not there's not a ton there versus they have a lot of value there's just not that many bluffs here and I feel like there are there would be way more bluffs that they could have if the ace and the jack of clubs were in play. Um, and that's why I, I would like a potentially a fold here. But what what's your take? Well, we get to the river, we have to always ask ourselves, what are we beating? Yeah. So now what are we beating? We're beating absolutely ace nine, right? Right. Right. Beating, yeah, if they had ace, ace ten, nine. they just got there. If they had exactly. eight, you know ace king or ace queen all along, they were already had us. Correct. Um, so, are they betting um, queens? No, probably no, not. No, they're going to probably try to get to their showdown. Use get their showdown value there. There's no need for them to bet those types of hands because you're turning a good equity or a value hand into a, into yep. a bluff, which is, doesn't make any sense at all. So you have to ask yourself, what are you beating? Yep. And, and so I think we beat no value. So the only thing we're beating correct. are bluffs and then the, what right. are the bluffs? And there just aren't that many. Right. The bluffs, we have the bluffs blocked. We're right. blocking all the bluffs. Right. Right. Well, um, I think you're also, you're also beating a few, pocket pairs um that he could be holding yeah, which, and bluffing with so well, unless well, there's something like pocket sevens or pocket sixes or something like that yeah pocket fives pocket nines but is he um, betting those i don't think he's betting the the thing is is like i don't think he's betting the river with those is he well he didn't bet the right. flop so right. and he he did bet the turn so he took Maybe he was just t- t- taking a stab at it on the turn. Yeah, right. I- I'm not sure. But then when he bets half pot again on the river, I, f- right. I think that that's, I mean, maybe if we have a read that, that our opponent is kind of this kind of ambitious, but in a th- if I've got, if I've got pocket sevens here on uh, an ace, eight, eight, six, what's the last card? Six ten, ten, ten board, ten. and I'm, I've I've seen them call. I don't know. I'm I'm like, well, I might I might beat something. I might beat a little something. See, this is where my problem is: is I get to the river and I'm not a believer, and I need to be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. So, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I mean, exploitative, exploitative poke live versus exploitative poker and live play by Alex Fitzgerald, and he talks us specifically about this spot. What are you beating on the river? You need to ask yourself, what are you beating on the river? Because in the games that we play, people are not 
bluffing the river enough. Yep. Right. And they're always betting with value. Unless you have a two pair are better off just folding. Yep. Because you need to ask that question. What am I beating? And the thing to always think about to me is that people are not, it's not that they don't bluff, it's that they don't bluff. People don't often turn uh, marginal value into bluffs. That I think is sort of a next level player that recognizes, say that, that, you know, if they had, let's say they had, I don't know, they got here with Jack 10 and they hit that 10 on the, on the, on the, on the river and they're like saying, well, I don't think my 10's good, so I need to I need to turn it into a bluff, right? Or they had pocket sevens and they're like, I need to turn my pocket sevens into a bluff. I don't think those are the kinds of hands most players turn into bluffs. What I think they turn into bluffs are hands like, well, I have king jack of clubs, or I can't have king, king queen of clubs, and there's no way that's good, so I I have to bluff with it. And there just aren't that many zero kind of equity hands like that that get to the river in this this kind of spot. That in a three bet pot that has been kind of bet big on the on the the turn and then on the on the river as well is, is sort of my take on it. And so I think this is a this is a a spot that we want to find a fold a decent amount of the time. And and we can call with our our hearts and our what's the a, is the ace of diamonds is the ace of, yeah we can call with our hearts and spade combo so we have ace of spades jack of spades ace of hearts jack of hearts those can be can turn into calls because now our opponent can have worse aces that they had with the with their club draws so they can have like ace of clubs you know five of clubs or something like that um, and we can beat that. Uh, when we have ace of hearts, jack of hearts, but they can't have the, any of that now. And so their bluffs have just shrunk into basically to be non-existent. Um, other thoughts Agreed. on this? Well, I tell you what, uh, let me just say this too. We're going to talk about a hand next week. That's very similar to this one. Uh, so this is kind of almost a two-part series. Uh, we're going to look at a hand that was played in in the web series Inside the Mind of the Pro um, that's very similar to the hand that Eric uh, played in this situation. Um, Eric did call, by the way, um, and Eric uh, got the bad news that they had ace-queen all along, which is what we kind of feared in this spot. I think that there just, there just aren't enough bluffs for us to 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 call off and it's not that and we're not just totally being results oriented i just think they're just so weighted toward those kinds of those kinds of um uh hands that we're just we're finding that out a lot when we get to this spot i had one question I, yeah uh, pre flop so if if uh if it, if it holds all the way around to us and we're sitting on the button with ice clubs jack of clubs why wouldn't you raise here Oh, we did. He just op- well, he opened. So I'm yeah, assuming we did. We did okay. open, and then we were we were three bet by the small blind. So we opened, and then we're okay. three bet by the small blind. So all right, I see. So it was a two. Okay. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and that I got you. And, and again, if you think about three bet pots, um, especially heads up type three bet pots, the the ranges in three bet pots are so close together compared to say he raised and gets called by the big blind i mean now the big blind could be wide open and he could have a lot of those weird hands but right the small blind three bet in the small blind he has to get through the big blind so now we we can really condense his range to he probably he could be somewhat polarized but he's more than likely has a very linear and strong range correct so yeah. So yeah, so we you know it really narrows down the the types of hands that he could have on the river. Yep, yep, yep. Agree, agree. 
Uh, well, like I said, uh, tune in next week because we're going to take this a very similar hand played by uh, a really good world class player, one of my favorite players uh, in the world, really. Um, and except we're going to add the wrinkle of it being multi way. And we're going to have a sort of a situation that's exactly like this. And then what do we do um, in this situation when it's multi way? So stay tuned for that part two next week. Uh, but until then, um, thank you to everyone who's listening. Uh, thank you to the Running Aces Hotel Racetrack and Cont- uh, Casino. Uh, thanks to Rob Washam, Bob Franklin for joining us. Thanks to our Wrecking Crew members, our audience. We'll see you next week. Good night.